All right. Good evening, everyone. Welcome to the second annual Robert W. Reader the First Distinguished Lecture in 19th Century History. My name is Amy Fluker, and I'm an assistant professor of history here at Youngstown State University. And I'm also privileged to serve as the reader professor. And it's through the Reader Memorial Endowment that I'm able to bring you this evening's distinguished lecture. This lecture series is inspired by Mr. Reader's commitment to lifelong learning and to local history in particular. The Reader Endowment supports a variety of programming on subjects in 19th and 20th century American history. Um, and if I may, I'd particularly like to call your attention to our upcoming symposium, Transportation, Movement and Mobility, which is scheduled for October 27th and 28th of this coming fall. Um, to see the call for papers and to find out more about other upcoming events, please visit our webpage at rear.ysu.edu. Um, and I put that web address in the chat box. Um, and now it is my pleasure to introduce you to this evening's speaker, Dr. Hillary N. Green. Dr. Green is an associate professor in the Department of Gender and Race Studies at the University of Alabama. And Dr. Green is a historian whose work I've admired for a long time, not least because she is so accomplished at building bridges between the work that professional historians do and school administrations do and, um, and building bridges to public interest as well. Um, my late advisor, Dr. John Neff once told me, we have to believe the work matters. And Dr. Green's work absolutely matters. And I'll add, I'm also completely in awe of her productivity. <laughs> so let me tell you a little bit about Dr. Green. She earned her MA in history from Tufts University and her PhD in history from the University of North Carolina at Chapel Hill. She's the author of Educational Reconstruction, African-American Schools in the Urban South, 1865 to 1890, which appeared with Fordham University Press in 2016. And she's also the author of numerous articles, book chapters, and other scholarly publications. And somehow, in between an extremely full speaking schedule, Dr. Green is currently at work on a second book project examining how everyday African Americans remembered and commemorated the Civil War. And she's also co-editing a new volume with Dr. Andrew Slap on the Civil War era and the summer of 2020. And Dr. Green is also working on an NPS OAH historic resource resource study of African American schools in the South. Dr. Green's lecture for us this evening is entitled Remembering Gettysburg, Joseph Winter, Songs, and Civil War Memory. So thank you, Dr. Green, for being with us. And I will um, get your presentation ready here. So just tell me when you're ready to advance slides. I want to thank you so much for coming out um, this evening to hear this talk. I am previewing work from this second book project on it's currently uh, entitled Unforgettable Sacrifice. And before I get started, um, in particular, because I'm talking about Franklin County, Pennsylvania, um, and a county that is near and dear to my heart, I need to disclose a couple things. My mother's um, family is from Franklin County, Pennsylvania, the same county of Joseph Winters. Um, they date um, back easily from 1820 to today in that county. And I am not related to Joseph Winters, even though um, his daughter married into the family at one point. <laughs> but my Civil War ancestor was Joseph Lane of the 22nd USCT Regiment, and he was a um, GAR member. And so um, I always have to talk about anytime I'm talking about Pennsylvania, I need to acknowledge my those Pennsylvania roots. Slide, please. Because tonight I want to talk about this man. This is Joseph R. Winters. He, uh, and for him, Gettysburg and the Gettysburg campaign of mid-June 1863 to the last day of the battle um, in early July defined his Civil War experience. He was a civilian in Chambersburg, Pennsylvania. And for him, what happened specifically the invasion occupation and seizure of African Americans who were born in the county and then later enslaved in Richmond will define everything he does after 1863. He won't forget this event. And so in order to talk about 
his why Civil War and why Gettysburg, I need to talk a little bit about him. Born free to a, African -American, a free African-American bricklayer and a Native American mother in Leesburg, Virginia, Winters relocated to Chambersburg where he became active in the Underground Railroad. He is known for his connections to John Brown, Frederick Douglass, and Shields Green and the meeting held in Chambersburg before the eight, um, 1859 John Brown raid. He is also known for his scientific work Slide, please. In which he was, he received patents and uh, work along improving fire escapes and the like. And these are his scientific um, drawings because he does receive a patent for it. Um, and the historical marker outside the Chambersburg Fire Department today acknowledges his scientific innovations and work for easing the work of fire departments, including the demonstration picture in the middle. And in that, little basket of this modified fire escape is his daughter. So she is a part of the experimentation in town. But what he's not known for is the songs and poetry that he is more lesser understood. Because for Winters, he used poetry and songs to express his emotions and feelings on different things. So for him, Civil War memory gets written down in verse. And it's the Gettysburg campaign and how he will remember the sights, the sounds, but the experiences of Black civilians like him um, and how they survived Gettysburg. He will then recruit for the Federal Army, and he will also then turn to national politics by writing a series of presidential campaign songs to mobilize Black Pennsylvania voters. In a sense, his songs function as important calls to action among the African Americans living at the Pennsylvania Maryland border. But it also reminded um, white Pennsylvanians in the nation of African Americans' existence, their unique Civil War experience, especially at the border, and their claims for citizenship in the post war landscape. Slide, please. So for Winters, his wartime experiences are essential. And his, so today I'm gonna to talk about his first songs and really go to some of his last ones. And, but you're gonna see how Gettysburg continues to define him because for Joseph Winters, he can't forget what happened in 1863. For him, it was not a military engagement on this a preserved battlefield that was, had been made memorable, but it was an invasion and occupation of South Central Pennsylvania. And while Frederick Douglass urged Black Philadelphians to enlist in the USET regiments, Winters and other Black residents had to attempt by avoiding enslavement by Lee's invaded army. And as one um, white county member would um, characterize the seizure of the mid-June period as, quote, a regular slave hunt. And they employed, in order their times to evade capture, they employed the Underground Railroad um, locales. And this is where Winter's own knowledge as a conductor on the Underground Railroad most likely helped him in surviving um, capture and enslavement. But for others, they weren't as fortunate. And it's the enslavement of free Blacks and self-emancipated individuals that will deeply affect those living Black and white in Franklin County. And what in white diarists, local newspaper accounts, and letters by local men ser now serving would be serving in the Massachusetts 54th Regiment noted the terror of those left behind, fear for loved ones, and discussed to what they who they call quote Negro stealers. And in this song, ten days about ten days after the Battle of Gettysburg really captures. Joseph Winters attempts to not allow others to speak his truth. He wants to capture what happened to African-Americans who survived this battle. And his title also gives you clues for this community because this is the second major invasion into the county. And so for them, once they start hearing the sounds of war, they start to hide. So, about 10 days after uh, the Battle of Gettysburg is when the Black community resurfaced. Those who could escape capture come back out. So for him, we know when he comes back into the community because by then the sights and sounds of war would disappear. And in this, he describes the occupation of Chambersburg, the seizure of goods, 
But in that third and fourth stanza, then he will talk about Lee and the troops that come in. And he has very choice words in describing this major civilian trauma afflicted. In Gettysburg, he took a stand and sent out scouts to scour the land. The railroad track he did tear up. Likewise, they turned out, uh, tore down the railroad shop. The stores they plundered, that you know, for that they do wherever they go. They bought their goods with Southern trash and that they got um, by the Southern lash. So again, slavery and how the attempts to buy goods. The colored people all ran away like the composer of the song they say, for if I had it, I don't know. I'd be in the South, a work in the home. And it's that last statement there, the colored people all ran away, really captures what they are doing. They're fleeing for their, they're valuing freedom, they're valuing their life. They know if they're captured, they will be enslaved. And so for them, this is a matter of freedom. This is a matter in which they could not wait for white residents to protect them. They had to protect themselves. And for them, flight mattered. And so for Winters in this song, he gave voice to the Black experience unmediated by the white county residents who are also writing diary entries. Um, a couple of the ministers are actually trying to negotiate the return of some of the enslaved people, um, African-Americans who become enslaved in um, Gettysburg. And they're successful with Amos Barnes, who they really get his release in December of 1863. But they didn't know what happened to them. They're trying to stop these seizures any way they could, and they too are failing. But Winters promises, if the Confederate troops ever come back to Gettysburg, that they won't run away. In one of the last uh, verses that he will proclaim that, and um, if you can go to the next slide for me. Now, if they come back, I'll tell you what to do. We'll give them some grape and canister too. Let light and black all shoulder a gun. And then, oh Lord, won't we have some fun? They're gonna fight back. They're not gonna be cowards. They're not gonna, they're gonna fight for the community. They're gonna fight for their lives. And they promise they're not gonna have the same return. And it's one of those things that by promising, by defending their communities alongside their white community members, they will have a biracial civilian army to protect their county from future incursions. And that black men will prove their manhood by fighting back. His words were not near bombast though, because T. Morris Chester, an African-American recruiter and wartime correspondent would come back to Franklin County and find willing recruits for both the Mass uh, 54th and 55th Massachusetts Regiment, but also some of the regiments that will be organized in Camp William Penn outside of Philadelphia. And it's this recent experience with war, this experience with a brush of possible enslavement and the enslavement of about 500 people in the county alone, but then through the border counties, a lot more from there, they're willing to fight back. So Winters goes from this song, Promise to Fight Back, to wholeheartedly supporting the cause for recruitment. And he fulfills what he promises in this verse about shouldering a gun, because he would devote his time and money towards military recruitment for the USCT. And he would help to enlist black Pennsylvanians into this sizable portion of the US Army that was secured the victory in 1865. And this is where Winters uses his songwriting skills again, because he will now publish a song for the draft. Next slide, please. At the time of the draft uh, the, uh, for the Civil War, he really starts to be inspired by other noted abolitionists, in particular Frederick Douglass's call of arms um, rally in Black men to enlist. And he's using this language of openly questioning black manhood if they avoided the draft. And he's, a, he's not about using shame. <laughs> and he will do this by calling them out if they don't. And in this song, this literate man who is well uh, versed and well educated mm -hmm. purposely adopts mm -hmm. black dialect. <laughs> And that black dialect is used to really get to the
um, and really debunking any excuses that they might have from a listing. About the draft, you might make a heap of fuss, but to be drafted that you must. Then if to be drafted that you, um, you don't wanna be, just leave the country and climb a tree. If you don't enlist in the draft, if you don't answer that call, you, the community will also reap so um, scorn upon you. You have to be men. You have to remember Gettysburg. And this is our opportunity to fight. And so in December of 1863, um, his son, Joseph Winters, as alongside my own Civil War ancestor, Joseph Lane, would enlist and leave for training. And they will enlist um, out of Chambersburg and go to um, Camp William Penn be ser before serving in a lot of the USCT, particularly the 24th and the 22nd USCT. And these are some of those regiments that will also have a play in April of 1865 in Richmond as well. And it's these remembrances that you have of these songs that these men, according to one Black um, GAR member, would recall that their decision transformed them from, quote, boyhood into sturdy manhood. And Winters remained an important voice in the Black uh, Franklin County community after the Civil War. Now he turns his energies for securing the franchise for Black Franklin County residents and reaping the civil, political, and social rights from their wartime sacrifices. And it's after the ratification of the 15th Amendment that he will become a significant um, leader within the local Republican Party. In this capacity, he rallied Black voters with a series of songs that used specific um, references to Gettysburg and other Civil War battles. And it's these post-war activities that reflects Winter's efforts to transform the Gettysburg campaign trauma that he endured into advancing meaningful change. But it's also too where he will experience disappointment with the Republican Party in achieving a more inclusive society. By the time his last three songs are published, Winters will have become a Democrat. But I want to talk about his first two songs and what he did. So one of the things we do know, next slide please, is that Winters did not draft a song for 1872, the first campaign that Black Pennsylvanians were able to participate in. However, we know that he sang the official Republican song that was designed for Black voters because Winters and others served as part of the Colored Grant and Wilson Club. And Joseph Winters is the second VP of this organization. The head of the organization, Thomas White, is a veteran of the Massachusetts 55th Regiment. And other members who will be on the leadership will also be veterans. And Thomas White be, uh, will eventually become the first GAR um, commander of the Black um, Post that forms in Chambersburg. So, Winters will allow a veteran to lead, but he is serving in the capacity of the second VP, and he co-chairs that VP position. And in this advertisement talking about a meeting that Winters would attend in Harrisburg to talk about with other Black voters of the states, what, who they will vote for in the 1872 election, they choose for, uh, Grant, and they pick that, pick that name for a reason. But in this in this brief response in the local Chambersburg newspaper, we know this, a new campaign song was introduced by the president, was sung by the meeting with great spirit and enthusiasm, after which Mr. Henninger was announced and delivered an able address on political questions of the day. And when you look at the 1872 song, what is interesting about this, it's designed for Southern Black voters and who were voted in their second election. And we don't know precisely why Winters starts to write a song in 1876, but based, because he doesn't leave us a lot of records, but based on why I read the song and what he does in his later songs, it's Gettysburg. Because those other campaign songs were designed for Southern, formerly enslaved people. But if people like Winters at the border who were freeborn, who dealt with the Gettysburg invasion, the 1862 um, invasion and incursion by Jeb Stewart that led to the seizure of several men, but also the 1864 burn of Chambersburg, their wartime experience was different. So Winters does something different. He writes songs that are meaningful to Black Franklin County residents.
Next slide, please. And this is his first campaign song. And it is for Rutherford B. Hayes and um, his candidacy. And Hayes here, which I think is very interesting where he sets this song, it's called a campaign song. All of his songs will have that same title. It will say by Joseph R. Winters, the moniker that he had before of Indian Dick, um, which was a local colloquial name for him is no more. It is his full name. The tune will always remain the same for all of his songs. We're marching through the gates, which is a common um, church song that would have been sung by a lot of the local black churches. And a his songs from this first one to his later ones will have very much a similar form. But one of the things you can see here, come to arms, brother freedmen, um, the foe is in our land seeking who may, he may devour with his iron hand. Referencing what happened in 63 with the foe being in Franklin County, coming in seasoned people, enslaving people, and with their iron hand and the military equipment. Now they have to don and girdle the armor of freedom, but also to their religious armor as well, and be ready at command to march with Hayes and Wheeler into that promised land. And so in this opening verse, he appeals directly to Black religious thoughts, embracing the African Methodist Episcopal Church and African Methodist Episcopal Zion churches. He also appeals to Black veterans, civilian survivors, and then later um, members of the GAR in the area. But one of the things that he does is having them don a new uniform for, um, and reminding what that uniform meant before during the Civil War, but now their political uniform, the uniform of manhood and the franchise, because they have to secure that promised land as God's chosen people. And this is where I think those messages of him being very much calling upon what war sounds like, what war was like. And for him, this particular battle was like going for fighting for freedom, that continuation of that civil war. But it's the memory of what happened in 63 that's gonna undergird all of his speeches and songs. Next slide, please. Because what he will talk about is really um, demonize the Democrats as he, and li like they were supporters of the Confederacy. For Tilden and his army with Hendricks in command and marching brother Freeman, you write to counter man. We see those re their rebel pickets. We hear their cannons roar. Like Herod and his army, we see to see no more. And it's that rhetoric of what it was like to experience and hear that seeing those pickets, hearing those sounds of war. And like the Confederate soldiers before, Hendricks and Tilden are there. We need to fight. They need to fight for their freedom and continuation. And one of the things that they will say is they have to fight and be honest men. And they have to go into the ballot in November and vote and take a stand. Because if they don't, their freedom is at stake, like it was in 1863. And so now Franklin County voters had to show their bravery as the USCT soldiers who responded to Winters and Douglas call earlier. Now they had to demonstrate their political manhood instead of their martial manhood by voting for Rutherford B. Hayes. Otherwise, they would be political ca cowards who allowed to retreat into their post-war political, economic, and social um, rights. Simply put, Black men had to step up. And they paid heat. Because as a voting bloc, um, Black Franklin County men overwhelmingly supported the Republican ticket. And you're talking about 95% of Black men who vote in this election, and it's overwhelmingly for the Republican ticket. So Winters, in his very first song, gets success. Rutherford B. Hayes is elected. So in 1880, he writes a second song, and this one's interesting because now it's Civil War memory on display because of who's running for office. Next slide, please. Because it is Civil War veteran Winfield Scott Hancock of Pennsylvania uh, versus James A. Garfield. And for those who know, I have cats named Rutherford B. Hayes and James Garfield. So <laughs> that my research even goes to cat names. But uh, Winters writes this song. And in um, this campaign, 
I know, no slide of cats. <laughs> but in this campaign, he chooses Garfield over Hancock. Can we go to the next slide? <laughs> there we go. And this is where I think is very much interesting because it's a referendum in many ways of what Gettysburg represented. And for the Winters and Black Franklin County men, they choose Garfield. And next slide. Set to the same tune as we're marching through the gates, Winter called again the service of Black men in this fight for postbellum and um, African American political rights and Civil War memory. He provocatively uh, suggested that pro Confederate raiders had invaded the Southern Pennsylvania County for a fourth time. And in um, where he says, come to arms, brother Freeman, the foe is in our land. And he warns again, it's in Hancock and English are the commanders of their band. Well, if Hancock's one of the heroes of Gettysburg, he's also flipping on this one. He's no longer a hero now to the black man. It is Garfield and Chester Arthur. And this is where for him, what Hancock and his Southern, the Southern sympathizers and former Confederate soldiers and veterans who are supporting him really shaped in his mind why they had to vote for um, Garfield. And so they had to go and fight against the South, Solid South United and the British industrial support. And this is where I think his intentional use of colonists, a call to arms in the first verse Winters is also warning Black Franklin County men to recall a similar order posed by Frederick Douglass editorial. And in many ways, this song of all of his songs are specifically called a call to arms to Black men. And that similarity and that likening of that with Frederick Douglass is part of how this song among all of his others will get remembered later on in the black community well into the 20th century because he directly even brings her attention to them. Next slide. And what he's calling them to, to remember is this quote, remember that in the contest with oppression that the almighty has no attribute which can take sides with the oppressor, the case is before you. This is our golden opportunity. Let us accept it and forever wipe out the dark reproaches unsparingly heard against us by our enemies. Let us win for ourselves the gratitude of our country and the best blessings of our posterity through all time. And once again, Winters is calling black men of Franklin County to do the same. And they are calling for a new fight for the country and the African-American community posed by the threat of what a Hancock presidency would be. And that would most likely, in their mind, think in disfranchisement. So like Douglas reminded them 27 years earlier, Winters too saw this election as the golden opportunity for them. And whites, once again, Black Pennsylvanians had served as liberators of the race and the nation and secured their gratitude and best blessings by voting for Garfield and Arthur ticket on November 2nd, 1880. Next slide. So those verses that you can have here, he's giving them the dates to remind them that they to go in. They had to fight and meet General Hancock and his army. And, but with Garfield in their command, they know they'll be able to succeed because of the concern of being slaves again. And that's where that to make American labor subjects of foreign lands, they'll become foreigners again no longer citizens of a nation. And this is where this, um, this is more explicit, like his 1876 song was, Gettysburg is looming large for him. And this campaign, because it's Hancock and because of Garfield, two Civil War veterans, it's a referendum what the war meant. And for Winters and Black men of the county, they knew they, Gettysburg and those invasions loom large. They knew what it was like. They do not wanna be, labor uh, foreign, uh, on foreign lands and become slaves again. Even with that brief rush, that was enough for them. And that's where I think for him, they really see these songs and Winters is going through. Cause remember these songs are not just read, they're sung. They're performed at every single political meeting. They're sung as they march to on election day to the ballot box. They are singing these songs when victory occurs. 
This is a performance that is being done. And through that performance and singing a very classic song, oftentimes in black churches, they're also bringing in the entire community. So in many ways, this is not just Winters articulating what Gettysburg meant, what the Civil War meant, it is the entire Black Pennsylvania border community who is telling and announcing what that war meant and why they were voting for the Republicans. And this, I think, is one of the things about this particular song that is so important. Next slide. So what happens between 1880 and his next songs? Winters becomes disappointed with the Republican Party of Pennsylvania. While he is a leader among um, black voters as the head of the segregated separate um, black um, political clubs, he does not get office. Other black men of the county who will run for office, they don't win. They're not really supported by the party. So Winters will abandon the Republican party and his departure will reflect the decisions made by a very small number of black men. And then by the end of his life, that number will be about 50-50, 50% Democrat, 50% Republican. And those who remain part of the Republican party will never forgive the Democrats and their allegiance during the Civil War, but their performance during Reconstruction as well. And they refuse to align themselves with that party. But for Winters and others who become disillusioned, they're looking for equality. They're looking for leadership. They're looking to be treated as full citizens. And that means they start to search out a new political home. So Winters could have chosen a third party to join, but he doesn't. He does try independent politics. So he might vote for Republicans on some um, of the party and then Democrats on the other. But by the 19, uh, by this, uh, these three songs in 1900, 1904, and his last one, 1912, he is firmly a Democrat. And he will write songs for the Democratic Party. What is fascinating about this is that when he leaves, the Republican Party will turn on him and call him a traitor. The Democrats will openly welcome Winters and his leadership, but also his songwriting skills. So we have a period of time where I believe he writes songs, but we don't have any surviving copies, but we do have these. First one in 1900, well, he will support um, Brian and Stevenson. The next one in 1904, <laughs> where he's again supporting the Democratic candidate. And in 1912, he will support Woodrow Wilson. And throughout these, it's the same tune. We're marching through the gates as the other ones. You still see a little bit more of the Civil War um, references and phrasing, but it's less now and more on a terms of a religious thought in which they're referencing how the wars um, both, uh, felt and remembered. And that's through religious ideology and the church and the references will be more to um, Egypt, more to there. But again, they are children of God who were God's anointed children and subjugated during the Civil War. So even then, they are referencing that war time period. But his last song, which is, I find telling and how Gettysburg still looms large, is when he writes that song. He writes it and it sees at the very bottom when it says composed by Joseph Winters of Chambersburg. July 4th, AD 1912. Gettysburg will always be there for him. So Winters will die. Um, he does not write a campaign song for 1916 because he will die, but Winters will continue to write poetry. He will continue to reference the Civil War. He is a cause celebrity because he lives a very long life. He will see the um, the 1840s and the Underground Railroad. He will see the Civil War. He will see Reconstruction, but he will also see the beginnings of the 20th century and a new generation of veterans. So Winters will still be there writing campaign songs. He is still politically active until he dies, but he will be firmly a Democrat. And for him, Gettysburg will always loom large in his mind for how he will remember the Civil War. And whenever he can, like his last song, he remembers it in verse because Gettysburg was unforgettable for him. 
So Joseph Winters, I think is very instructive for offering how rural Pennsylvanians remembered the Civil War and how they remembered the Civil War in Gettysburg in particular, not in traditional means, not in diaries, not in um, parades all the time, but oftentimes in verse in songs that can be performed by community events. And it's that performance that they're also reminding and communicating to the community what the war meant and training the next generation of African-Americans to consider military service because he will always remember, um, remind people that his son served and was a veteran and also deserved for pension. He will remind people through these songs and the references to Gettysburg that Black Pennsylvanians on the border too suffered trauma of the Civil War. And that they, their experience differed than say Philadelphia or Harrisburg, but their experience mattered. And their experience mattered in very political ways that it could be mobilized at any time to tell the nation that they were citizens, even if it was simply voting. So as we think about Joseph Winters and this particular man, let us remember him not just for his scientific achievements, but for his songs and how he chose to remember Gettysburg. Thank you. And the next slide that says thank you on it. <laughs> <laughs> Yay! Okay, let me stop sharing. Well, thank you very much, um, Dr. Green, for a wonderful talk. Um, I have many, many questions I'd like to ask, but um, I would like to open it up to the floor for questions. Um, so uh, if you guys have a question for Dr. Green, feel free to um, use the raise hand function um, on the reactions button or drop a message in the chat and I will be happy to um, relay any and all questions to Dr. Green. Oh, I see a question. Lois, I'm gonna unmute you, feel free to ask away. Great, thank you. It was a wonderful talk and I could, I'm sorry, I'm on the treadmill and it's just stopping. Oh. <laughs> I could ask many questions because it was fantastic. Um, but I'll start with this one. You mentioned, and I, we could see it a little bit on the slide that his initial work was published under this nickname. Do I have it right, Indian Dick? Yes. Would you talk a little bit about racial identity? You mentioned something about his parentage, but how is he being framed or how is he framing himself with that name or with giving up that name? And what have you found around that? Yeah, so one of the things about this area claims to Native American heritage, especially um, a lot of people from Virginia and, um, and come in is something that will distinguish because colorism is a real thing in this county and colorism and ties to Native American heritage, in this case, it's his mother, that he has that direct ties. And it's something that he will use to distinguish himself from Southern enslaved people. So it's a way to distinguish that way. Now, Indian Dick though, that I am still trying to figure out who gave that to him, but I know he sold songs and made money with it. So, <laughs> so it is, I think in his early, pre-Civil War phase and a lot of these songs and different things, it, it was a way to make money to add. He is a landowner, he's a gunsmith, he has a lot of layers. I just think he just likes writing songs and performing these songs. So for that gave him another idea and character. But when he starts writing those uh, presidential campaign songs, Indian Dick is dropped and even the local white community won't use it anymore, except when he's like, he either, depending on which birth date you accept, he's either 92 or 102 when he dies. <laughs> it's at the end of his life when he's attending a baseball game and they have him there, all white hair, very frail. That's what they mentioned. He was early on remembered this as um, Indian Dick, and but now Winters does this and remember. So he becomes this greater than life figure. But racial politics and claim the Native American heritage is something that's very, and colorism, something that really defines this community. But how that term, and when, I wish I do, because I'm like, how would you call yourself that? that but it also reveals so much about this county because because um, I have ties to that county. I can still see the, how those claims get used. And Indian, and all these non-PC terms 
are used often include in red, yellow, things like that to talk about skin color, and it goes more into those politics of uh, respectability and colorism of anything. Thank you. And go back to your uh, treadmill. I'm impressed. <laughs> uh, let's see. Uh, we got a question in the chat from Nick. Did he receive a lot of public backlash from his peers for flipping political parties? Yes, he does. And this is one of the things I think is fascinating because he switches. Um, he is called a traitor. He is called a turncoat. And one of the things about Winters is he doesn't shy from controversy. He just publishes a commentator bag and like, yeah, I was called this, but let me talk about you. And so he's also pushing back. And so while he's called, he's also charged against them. And one of the things he would be, um, would be accused of is that he, was, he didn't, wasn't really a Republican. And he's like, no, the Republican Party didn't treat us anything differently other than when they needed our votes at election time. That's when they came to the Black community. So he is very much responding to his critics. But in the Black community, one of the things that happens is not in his lifetime. And a lot of that is they'll still have a Democratic club and they'll have a Republican club. But when he dies and his hold is no longer complete over the county, you will see an alternate memory of Joseph Winter's form. And it's because he changes. He also refused to be the community banker for people. That didn't buy him any love. And if he didn't like you, he told you he did not like you. So on his deathbed, one of the things that he does, he writes a poem to his son, telling him he's a disappointment in him. That just tells you <laughs> how this man is. So it's when he dies that other memory starts to come in. And when they do talk about Winters and his songs, they only talk about his 1880 song or 1876. They will never talk about those later songs for uh, Woodrow Wilson or 1900, 1904. It is only the Republican songs and those first songs not the last songs. So it's Civil War and those first two campaign songs. So he'll become cemented in time because the talk about that shift to remember those later songs means also re remembering that tension and visible split within the black political community and how that really shook up things and how Winters was criticized and both sides would be criticized for those who defected and those who remained. It looks like Donna has a question. I'll uh, unmute you and feel free to ask away. Hello, Donna. Hi, Martha. <laughs> Hi, Martha. <laughs> um, yeah, I'm sorry. I, my link, for some reason, my link would not connect. So I did what I would always do would be text Donna and say, can you get me the link? So there are two Donna de Blasio's in here. Cool. Um, but my question is this. Um, does Winter's defection from the Republican Party in any way reflect sort of the larger changes that are going to happen in the 1920s? Mm -hmm. And for example, Al Smith in 28, and then Roosevelt's new coalition. I know that it's like 10, 15 years later, but it seems to me that it's it's he's one of the first that sort of recognizes that a that a party that favors um, big business and um, all of the other things that the Republicans will come to stand for through the teens and the 20s is really alienating to African Americans and to ethnic groups in general. Yeah, and this is one of the things why I liked his defection, because we have books about Baltimore and Black Baltimoreans doing this, and they do this within um, the Mutual Brotherhood Association. We also see this in Boston with independent politics. But for him, being in rural Pennsylvania, so it's sort of part of the state on the line, not being in Philadelphia, not being in Pittsburgh or Harrisburg, he's on that early trend that we usually call to the big cities. 
And he will reflect that growing shift of what happened with those coalitions because um, one of the things I have noticed um, as I go further in time, because I go into um, the 1980s in these counties, I follow the women, what they're doing. You really see those shift into from the Republicans into the Democrats. And by the 30s, it's gonna be more Democrats because of um, Roosevelt um, than there will be Republicans. But you'll still to this day have a very small vocal black Republican party in the county that dates back to this Republican party. And that's one of the claiming things are in there. And I had that um, through relatives and other people there too. But there's something about the 20s and others, but he starts in 1884 and he tries to reform the party like it's done in Boston, what's done in Baltimore. And he's just like, you know what, enough is enough. I've seen enough. And he goes, but he brings his resources with him and he brings about 50% of the black voters. It's significant enough that that numbers is gonna to start to grow, especially by the time you get to the teens. And by the late twenties, early thirties, it's gonna be more Democrat than it is Republican. But yeah, he's really an early example of that and something that, I don't trace out a lot in the um, book, but I see that tr continuation and I make nods to it because he's definitely saying like, no, the Republicans don't have them at heart except on election day. And that's what he calls them out on. He's like, you only come out for us when it's time you need us to vote in November. We need more than this. And we also need more rights. We need more businesses. We need more working conditions. You're not for us anymore. And that's something I don't think they would envision in 1876 or at 72, but by the mid 1880s, he really is, as a, he can see it. And I think that's one of the fascinating things is. It's sort of a related question. I know that as populists form, there are black African-American, I think they're colored, called yep. colored wheels. Mm -hmm. um, is that indicative of this shift too? I haven't seen much of it. And this is, I think it's just also the numbers. They're small. <laughs> it's a small area. So for them, they, and I, it kind of surprised me that they didn't go independent party, that they didn't go some of the more labor um, parties that Matt Stanley talks about in there um, as well, because it's Pennsylvania and a lot of, um, especially with the two parts of the other half of the state. Um, this is definitely what they call uh, the middle part. It's very conservative. And I thought they would do that. They really stuck to traditional parties and didn't do the populists, didn't do there, but they support Brian. <laughs> like it's, <laughs> cause he's traditional, but if he was in that traditional party, they're not going after the third party route. So they know enough to stay within the traditional two party system. And that's about it. So you don't really see a lot of that independent third party and smaller party ones. In fact, those numbers you will get by 1904, um, 1908, one or two who will try that route, but it's so small and insignificant within a cycle, they're back within the traditional party system. Looks Thank like you. I'm fascinated. Yeah. <laughs> it looks like Amanda has a question. Yes. Uh, hi. Um, uh, Amanda Kleintop, um, long admirer of your work. Um, and thank you, Amy, for, for putting all this on. Um, I, I was also really fascinated by a, a lot of this and uh, some of my questions have been answered. So I thought I would take the kind of self-interested question as also a native Pennsylvanian, yeah. but from the Eastern side, like Philly and Lehigh Valley. Mm -hmm. um, so like, I'm like, where even do I start? Um, I, well, first of all, in the end, you mentioned like those other Pennsylvania civil war memories. So I'm just really curious to hear how, like how you would juxtapose him to those other memories and move those forward into these different politics that we are talking about because, and I'm not sure you can get this far, but I'm even just fascinated by how the idea that like, I grew up only learning about Gettysburg in Pennsylvania Civil War history. Um, and yet Winters is still completely foreign. And, and, and yet he's defending the idea of like this rural Civil War memory. It's just, it's a, it seems messy. So, but I'd be interested to hear. Does and this is where a lot of their battles are with Philadelphia and Pittsburgh. Harrisburg, they're okay with. <laughs> like they're okay with Harrisburg because 
um, railroads, they're on the railroad network. So they'll take trains a lot to these various places. But one of the earliest fights that Winters gets involved in um, is um, 1865, November 1865, to have a grand reception for returning Black um, soldiers. And they wage lawsuits against the Philadelphia. So Philadelphia sues the Harrisburg people who actually host it. Pittsburgh files a lawsuit all about who gets to be the lead city to organize this event that's supposed to be celebrating Black soldiers, returning Black soldiers. <laughs> And then when Winters in 1872 goes to that convention, what helped smooth it out that now they have the franchise and they're like, oh, we can unify together on this national question and forget about who's leading because we all have our individual Grant and Wilson clubs so that we can control our individual thing. So it usually comes down on who's leading this. And this is where Philadelphia and Pittsburgh and then Harrisburg to a lesser extent tries to come in like, no, we're gonna, it's us. We just sit over here. So the uh, middle part of the state and along the Cumberland Valley Railroad becomes this really central part, like what about us? And they actually will align themselves more with people in Hagerstown, Maryland, Baltimore. So they'll go south because those are their networks. So you'll see more alignment with the Baltimore. Uh, Baltimore comes up all the time into Franklin County for the Grand Army Republic. That's the, the Martin Delaney post. So they'll have things there. They will be at Antietam where the Lion um, post will be. And then also in Carlisle where the Jesse J, uh, G. Thomas is. But then they'll connect with the West Virginians and the Baltimore um, GAR. So they're all central parts. So that's what's going to be their part there. And in terms of politics, they tend to go within those regions and they try to avoid both Pittsburgh and, um, and also with uh, Philadelphia because they feel like the poor cousins. They're treated not with the respect because they're poorer and they're not of the same networking. So it becomes more of internal black politics rather than the big national ones, except when it comes down to those first elections. And then when you start seeing the splits and breaking up, some of those internal politics start to come in play in which um, churches in Philadelphia will start to question. Because one of the things that unites them even more, they are church going people. And as AME church members, they go to conference every year in Philadelphia. So they are still connected that way. So what they talk about will start to shift, but they will know back to the AME realm. They'll, they'll go back to that church family realm. But it's fascinating. And also too, for me, why I picked Franklin County is because I heard about Gettysburg from the porches of these communities. Even though I always went to Gettysburg. I, I have pictures of me growing on all sorts of battlefield pictures and statues. And then my dad's family is from the Charleston Low Country. So you also have me on the Battery of South Carolina. Same thing. Don't do this. Don't have your kids climb statues like we did. But, <laughs> but it was because of those porches. It usually ended up like, oh, you went to Gettysburg. Let's talk about Lee, who stole people. Let's talk about here. And then also... Philly, they were out, they never experienced the war. <laughs> we did. So it was very much as intentional claims of that invasion as giving them claims to remember, but also a sense of hurt um, that they're not being remembered, they're not being talked about. Ed Ayers talks about them a little bit more, but not the politics. And as one, um, I presented this recently at Chambersburg, and one of the things I heard from a long-term Black family that's been there just as long as my mother's family has been there, they're like, we're still here. Six, 1863 didn't define us. We're still here. What about how we remember? So I think this is where we need more. And I wish I could do more of Lehigh Valley because I'm like that. I know some of those stories, but this one I was like, let me just start here and then get encourage other people to do that work. But I find it fascinating with the politics side. It comes down who gets the lead. And when you answer that question and see what then shake sees how it shakes out, but they are willing to sue one another over that chance to remember and lead the organization, and then put all that aside to work on a set goal, and then go back to the corner like we're still in the middle of the state. That's great, thank you. Uh, 
let's see, we got a question in the chat from Bridget. Was the campaign song the same tune every year, even when he changed political parties? It is. So this is where I think it's funny. It, he does that because it's a known and very popular song in the black churches. So what he does is everyone can know the song. Everyone knows the tune. So if you have someone playing the piano, they can all perform the same song. So, but then the verses change. So then you have to have the new verse in front of you and not the church song in front of you. But he intentionally did that. And it's something that I know is a lot about other campaign songs. They try to set it in a regular tune that's in vogue within the church communities where these will often be times performed um, and where these meetings will be held. But he kept the same song. And one of my challenges is I am trying to find this song. I want to see the music and hear what this will sound like. And I have some friends who are willing to play, if I can find the actual song sheet with this, uh, with the uh, music on it, they will, they'll perform, they'll make a recording for me so I can actually hear it. Because now I'm curious, like, what's this? And, um, and this is where the curiosity, I even went to the churches in those areas. I was like, okay, Amy, I know your hymnal. <laughs> what song is this? And there are now, they think, we think it's one or two possible songs, but they're now going back into their records to see if they can find those early hymnals, if they have the music for it. But he uses the same tune. And another tune that they will use, the same thing with the GAR songs, they will use the same songs over and over again. But this one he knew, keep the same tune, new lyrics, but everyone knows those verses. Everyone has the same stanzas, that same beginning, sometimes the same end, just the name of the people change. And some of the issues with the later on, there are national issues will change, but it's set to the same meter every single time. And that's how I also know, even if it did not have his name on it, I can look at all the songs in a row and see where those changes are, how, um, what he added, what he didn't add, where the sounds of war come in and how that mirrors other things. And, um, and then also track his songs from 10 Days After Gettysburg, which is a different tune. His draft song is a different tune than what his campaign songs would be. And what does those changes mean based on the mood that he's trying to evoke? But he kept the same tune for every single song. I'm surprised that that, um... That, that music's been difficult to track down. When you said it was a popular church song, I just kind of assumed it would um, be readily available. Um, we're sort of coming up on an hour. Can I exercise my privilege as host and ask you one final question? Yes. <laughs> um, I think it was the draft song that was written in dialect. Yes. And I just sort of wondered if you could comment on his usage of dialect. Yeah, and I think that was very interesting, his choice there, because he was literate. And that's one of the things he pro he prides himself on. He could read and write. He knew how to do that. But he's appealing to a Black community where that will not get an actual public school until the 1880s, because they are small in number. So it's a lot of tutoring and the like. So he's really appealing to the dialect of Black community members at the time. And it's the one song that he actually does this. He does not do it the other songs, which I think is very fascinating because he's speaking directly to Black Franklin County members. And it'll be people like my um, Civil War ancestor. He was illiterate. He signs everything with his ex until he dies. So for him, he couldn't read or write. And um, knowing the intonation, different things, I was like, yeah, he's speaking to people like that. And so it's not this rich man who's uh, wealthy, who uses colorism, who has a job, who he actually owns land. He's speaking to the people. And that I think is one of the fascinating things, but he also talks about the community scorn that will happen if they didn't enlist. So my Civil War ancestor enlists on Christmas day, 1863. He does not go early. So I, I imagine he probably one of those people like the others that come out that <laughs> early years who realize like, okay, I really do need to enlist. <laughs> and he enlists. So he's one of those people who I know will enlist at the later date and others will too. So you'll have eight, December of 1865, uh, 1863, up until early 1864, um, up to, uh, you'll have a huge rash of enlistment from that particular area. The first round will occur um, 
for the Massachusetts 54th and 55th. That's the first wave. And then the other ones will be there. And in Franklin County, you'll have about 25 individuals who um, will go to that first call up in Massachusetts and serve in that regiment. And the rest will be served in the Pennsylvania regiments. Well, I see the all... thing about Sandra Graham. Thank you. I'm going to look. <laughs> oh, yeah, great. We've got a link. All right. Well, um, thank you once again, Dr. Green, for a fabulous talk. Thank you to all of our attendees. I noticed um, several of my students um, in the participant list. Um, don't uh, hesitate to reach out with me to make sure I, I saw that you were here. Um, I'm going to also make a last plug. Please visit our website reader.ysu.edu to stay up to date on our programming um, and look out for our call for papers for our transportation movement and mobility conference coming up this October. So thank you, Dr. Green, and have a wonderful evening, everybody. Thank you so much.